Well, good afternoon if you are in New York or Pittsburgh or Houston or Minneapolis, and good evening if you are in places in Europe such as Berlin, Ferrara in Italy, um, places where my guest today, my wonderful guest today, has been, has worked, has evoked. Uh, Ricky Ian Gordon has covered the world, and we're going to talk about that today, the wonderful composer. But welcome to Fred Plotkin on Fridays on Adagio, the place where classical music happens. As you know, Adagio is a video and audio streaming platform dedicated to supporting artists and to making classical music and opera available to fans all around the world. Regular visitors to this page know that I like to invite people who inspire me, people I like. Um, sometimes there are people I don't know at all. Sometimes there are people that I don't necessarily like, but I admire their work. In today's case, this is a gentleman that I've known in the business through the years, for many years. We've not hung out very much, but I think there is mutual respect and infect, affection and infection too. <laughs> <laughs> and I certainly like him very much. Ricky Ian Gordon is one of the foremost composers in the United States. And he told me that he does not have COVID, but he is battling a cold. He's entitled because he has not one, but two operas premiering in the space of the next 10 days. And he's been shuttling between theaters and, and rehearsals and so on. And I want to talk to you about that. But first, Ricky, welcome. Great to see you. Thank you, Fred. I'm so happy to be here. So the two operas that are about to go up, as we say here, are The Garden of the Finzi Contini's, based on the novel by Giorgio Bassani that became a very famous film, and Intimate Apparel, based on a play by Lynn Nottage. It was one of her earlier plays. She went on to win two Pulitzer Prizes for playwriting. It's at Lincoln Center Theater, where it's the Garden of the Finzi Contini's is at the Museum of Jewish Heritage. It's co-presented by the New York City Opera and the National Yiddish Theater of Folksbine. Which one would you like to talk about first? I'm going to let you you decide, Fred. All right, I'm going to start with the hear about Carol. first. Okay, great. Carol, because All I right. think that it was supposed to premiere before it was... Yeah. I had tickets for two years ago, right? Yes, we were. And we were I have tickets now, yeah. but um, two years ago, the pandemic crept in and many works that were in rehearsal in New York City at that time, suddenly everything shuttered in the middle of March of 2020. Talk first about this play by Lynn Nottage, which is a wonderful play, by the way, and a great subject matter for an opera. It is well, you know, it's it's not only a great subject matter for an opera, but when I decided that I wanted to write an opera with Lynn, I Facebooked her and I said, I have this commission from the Met. Do you want to write an opera with me? And she wrote back and said, I've always felt my play Intimate Apparel was an opera. So even she knew <clears throat> when she was writing it. It's a very, very beautiful play. Um, which takes place in 1905 on the Lower East Side of Manhattan in a sort of uh, a boarding house for women, many of the women being prostitutes. And uh, a Mrs. Dixon runs the house. And there's a woman who lives there named Esther. Es and Esther Mills is a seamstress. And she came to Mrs. Dixon when she was a very young girl. And she is allowed to live there because she creates intimate apparel for the I think we've had a slight freeze in the internet. Okay, we may have to unfreeze that. We'll switch to me. Um, all right, so I'm going to take over a bit because Ricky's internet, I think, is frozen and mine is free. Um, Intimate Apparel, and I'm working from memory, when it premiered at the Roundabout Theater at the American Place on 46th Street, starred 
then a relatively unknown actress named Viola Jones, Viola Davis, sorry, who went, of course, on to great things. I see that Ricky has now been um, lost and we're trying to get him back. And it was also a new play that was by a relatively new playwright, Lynn Nottage. Uh, Lynn Nottage just recently had a play on Broadway that closed because it was scheduled to called Clyde's, which already is being talked about for another Pulitzer Prize. She's working on Intimate Apparel, the opera, right now with Ricky Ian Gordon. And she also has written the libretto, the text for MJ, which is a musical about Michael Jackson. So she and Ricky Ian Gordon are all multitasking. And it's a rather unusual thing, given that there's a pandemic in New York City and everywhere, but where the theater and musical um, presentations that we have here have all been threatened by the COVID, by the fact that people have tested positive, that shows have closed. It's an unusual struggle. And I'm going to try to, when Ricky comes back, try to ask him about the special challenges entailed in that. But in the meantime, let me tell you a bit more about Ricky and Gordon. He is from Long Island. He studied at Carnegie Mellon University, which is in Pittsburgh and a very famous school for theater, uh, theater arts, especially the technical aspects of theater. And he has written many operas. Uh, many. I, I can't think of any other person right now who's a contemporary composer who's written as many operas. Um, among them were A House Without a Christmas Tree for Houston Grand Opera, Morning Star, which was about Jewish immigrants uh, at Cincinnati Opera, 27, which was about Gertrude Stein and her time in Paris, and that was presented in St. Louis a wonderful opera that I saw called A Coffin in Egypt, with a libretto by the excellent Leonard Folia that was presented in Philadelphia and starred Frederica von Stade in a role that was different from a lot of what she's done. She played a rather um, overtly racist woman who was not aware of her racism, but nonetheless, it was quite overt. He did a song cycle called Rappahannock County with Mark Campbell, who was my guest here a couple of years ago. He did a really wonderful opera, I think a classic that will always live as long as people go to the opera called The Grapes of Wrath, based on the novel by John Steinbeck. You probably have seen the film with Henry Fonda. It's a magnificent opera. He did a song cycle opera called My Life with Albertine, based on Proust's remembrance of things past, at least part of it. Uh, he did a song cycle called Oh, Benton Book of the Dead. Hello, Ricky. I Good am so sorry. Was that, right. I don't know if it was my internet or yours. That's, it wasn't mine, but I think it's a good thing that you've written so many operas because I've oh, been listening. You were, <laughs> you were doing my bio. That's always a good thing. Okay, and good. I, I spoke a bit about Lynn Nottage and about the fact that she... Yeah. Um, you were shuttling between two productions. She had three going very recently. She had Clyde's, a wonderful play that I saw at Second Stage. Very comic, but also very deeply felt. Um, your opera, Intimate Apparel, and a new musical about Michael Jackson. But anyway, get back to the story of Esther in Intimate Apparel. So... Esther, the, the Upper East Side matrons start hearing about Esther's fabulous intimate apparel and hire her to create this sexy, beautiful intimate apparel to um, lure their husbands back into bed or away from their mistresses. And um, really, when Lynn wrote the play, she wrote it as a memorial for her mother. And it's these beautiful, in, in the play, it's, it's many scenes between two people. And when I read it, I thought the characters were so rich. The character of the Orthodox Jewish um, salesman who sends her her fabric, who sells her her fabric, who clearly the minute they, we see them together, you realize there's an energy between them. The man, George, who starts writing Esther letters from Panama. Um, 
Mrs. Van Buren, who is one of the women who hires her, a white woman on the Upper East Side, to create intimate apparel for her. Mamie, the prostitute. It's they're wonderful characters, and I and Mrs. Dixon, who runs the the house she lives in. And I I just thought it was so rich, and I also felt like this happens sometimes when you read something and you see a door immediately. Like I just know there's a door into this piece for me, and. So it happened very quickly. The Met loved the idea, but they wanted to know how Lynn would open it up. So Lynn and Peter Gelb and Andre Bishop from the Lincoln Center Theater and I met and Paul Cremo, that dramaturg at the Met to talk about Lynn's ideas about opening up the play, which were numerous and brilliant. And we started work on it. And really what took a while was the process of Lynn whittling her play down to a libretto because that's the hard thing for a playwright. There, it's so, so, there's so many words. And for you to boil your play down to stock and trust that the music is going to tell a lot of the story, that was hard for her, but she was also a great sport and brought no ego to the table. So she did three different drafts until she got it. And when she got it, she really got it. And for me, the way I can tell when a librettist gets it is I look at the page and I'm excited to set what's there and I'm not overwhelmed. Because if you see a, if you see a page full of words, all you feel is obligation. It's fear and obligation like, oh my God, how am I gonna set all these words to music? But there's a kind of spareness you see on a page where the words are very meaningful and impactful, but they you see space all around them for what you're going to bring to them. Do you as a composer with your librettist, and you've had many fine ones who are among our best right now in, in working in America, guide them, provide guidance? For example, I've read, and I'm sure you've read, the endless correspondence between Verdi and his librettists. I have always been fascinated about Puccini, that Puccini for most of his operas hired two librettists. One of them was more a journalist and the other was more a poet. And the journalist would get to the nub of the story and the poet would provide better language. And in each Puccini opera, the language is very particular to the character, so La Boheme, there is a writer in La Boheme and Rodolfo speaks in a very different way than the other characters. Right. Whereas um, in Tosca, they speak with a directness, a, a sort of a gutsiness that there's no poetry there at all. In Turandot, it has the feeling of a fable. In Suor Angelica, it really feels like a confession. And I don't mean the religious, but he so beautifully guided his librettist and he always picked two so that they would fight with one another and Puccini would get the best out of both of them. Um, he it's was very sad. manipulative that way, whereas Verdi would only usually work with one, but have a very strong input. So do you, with your librettists, do any kind of guidance or how do you work with them? I have a very particular relationship with each one of them. And you, ha you have to know that I, I'm not saying unlike other composers, but like me, I, I started words first. I was in love with poetry before anything. So I love words and I'm very particular about them. So obviously that has a lot to do with the librettists I pick. I have to love what they do first. Um, but then I feel like, if you ask the librettists I work with, if I'm what I'm like to work with as a composer, I feel like it can be really useful because I have a sense of what should happen sometimes. And I feel like I can guide them because of my love for poetry and also because of my love for, I've been going to the theater since I was a little boy, you know? So for example, can I, I'll give you an example or two. Like when Michael Corey and I were writing The Grapes of Wrath, he had a Which, moment. By the way, while you were offline, I praised to the skies. Oh, that you did? Yes, what did you say? How could I miss that? <laughs> well, because you were trying to get your internet back. Just consider that I think it's fantastic opera. Go ahead. Oh, thank you for it. Well, this would interest you then. Um, 
when uh, Michael gave me the libretto for act one and I was going along and I was setting it to music and I got to a place where Connie Rivers, Rosa Sharn's uh, first boyfriend, her erstwhile boyfriend, um, is singing about the Lincoln Zephyrs. He and, he and Rosa Sharn are sitting on a highway overpass and he's singing about the Lincoln Zephyrs. That was the whole scene. And I said to Michael, this happens at a place in Act One where it has to be the love duet. This has to be the moment when we get inside of Rosa Sharn and Connie. And it's also the only moment where we're really going to get to know Rosa Sharn. We need a window. It's like I said, this is the 11 o'clock moment of Act One. So Michael define went 11 o'clock moment. I know what you mean, but define it. It's like that sort of the big defining moment of the act. It's where it's like a culmination. You know what I mean? It's like where I want comes screaming. Do you know what I mean? It comes from the fact that Broadway shows used to begin at 830 and they would end just before 11. So the 11 o'clock moment was the great clinching event of the show, usually sung by Ethel Merman. (laughs) Right. So and I knew this had to be that moment in Act One. So Michael went home and wrote one star. And if you know the opera, all of the yearning in a way of all the characters exists in that aria one star when Rosa Sharn sings sometimes when faith ain't quite enough nights when the moon don't shine when you can't see your nose through a maze of shadows heaven hangs out a sign one star one star one small star that's mine and it was so exquisitely beautiful but the only credit I take for it is that it wouldn't have existed if I didn't say, Michael, this is what we need here. And I'm not bragging about the fact that I knew we needed that. That's what I bring to the table. With Royce Vavrek, when we did 27, at one point, Royce wrote a little thing about the wives of geniuses, which was the famous thing about Alice B. Toklas, um, who always sat with the wives of the geniuses while Gertrude sat with the geniuses. And he wrote a little charming thing, but he was in Canada at the time. And I called him and said, Royce, this has to be a major number. Like this is a big thing. And then we both crafted into a number, this whole thing about the wives of geniuses, which basically Alice does to entertain Gertrude. And it happens on every opera. It's like, There are things I know, and I don't know how I know them, but I know them intuitively. I have been obsessed with opera since I was eight years old. And there are internal instincts about this is what we need here. And I feel like I can be useful to a librettist in terms of saying this needs to go there. And then you work with people good enough to know and they go there. You know what I mean? And. And also because I love words so much, sometimes I can even be useful in terms of the prosody or in terms of like Lynn might give me exactly what she needs something to say, but I can shape it into exactly what the music is doing. Do you know what I mean? There's, I really feel good about that. I feel like I'm a really good composer for librettists to work with. I'm just particular about which librettists I want to work with. Now, what happens, this has happened in some cases where you've written the text. Yes. Um, well, that is obviously, those are very, very personal pieces. And when those texts happen, they literally explode out of me. Like Orpheus and Eurydice, I wrote at four in the morning in a fever dream. And Green Sneakers, I literally wrote sitting on my bed, staring into the closet, like practically moments after Jeffrey died. Those libretti are... Um, they're purgatives. I mean, they they had to exist and they needed to exist in order for me to survive. And then setting them to music is another kind of like a cold sweat because I I feel an incredible sense of obligation to make my words work on the page as a piece of drama. Or even that something like Ellen West, which I admire Ellen West. I have a special spot. Oh, okay, good. Okay, great. All right. I adored it. I adored it. So we're going to get to that. Fred, I loved that. And I was sitting in the row with you. But so the thing (laughs) is, I um, I feel. By the way, that is an obligation when you're sitting next to a composer watching his opera. 
I, I hope he likes it because he's three seats away from me. But um, I, I do feel that is a whole other thing, those libretti I write. And I can't plan them. I can't plan when they're going to come. I can't plan when I'm going to write them. They are just explosions of necessity. All right. So this brings up a really important topic about creativity that I didn't necessarily plan to go to, but I'm going to. Um, I'm people number writer, and I've done a lot of collaborative theater stuff. I'm not a singer, but um, I know what you're talking about when you suddenly are overtaken by the creative, not urge, but need. And um, in my shower, I have a a board and writing where I can write while I, if I'm still under the water and the hot water and so on, so that it won't erase. Because oh, sometimes yeah. the idea comes to you and you have to put it down. Yes. Um, I, maybe you too, I keep a pad near my bed and a pen and I don't enter things in my phone, but I actually handwrite it out because the act of handwriting is a different creative <laughs> process than tapping into a phone. Yes. But I remember once, years ago, I was working at Santa Fe Opera and I was with my mom and she'd never been to New Mexico. And I suddenly said to her, mom, I'm sorry, you're just going to have to do something for the afternoon because I have to sit here and there's something I have to do. And I wrote something out that was, it was, I didn't think of it five minutes before. It was just born there, a little inspired by Santa Fe, but not terribly much. She was actually in Taos, not Santa Fe. Mm. And if you can, if you've ever thought about this, define physically what that feels and emotionally when suddenly you're just overtaken and you have to do this thing at that moment. You know, there's this famous line that Stravinsky said, I am the vessel through which passed La Sacra, right? There is, for me, there's always a kind of shadow pressing against my back. If I have an opera that I'm going to write or that I'm writing, it always feels like a kind of pressure telling me what the next thing to do is. And unlike some composers, it doesn't give me notes, but it gives me a sense, a sense of what the next gesture is, or I just have, it's like a sense, but it always feels like a shadow pressing. With something like those libretti that suddenly say they have to be written, it's literally physical. I will break into a sweat. It's like a vasovagal attack. And um, the Orpheus and Eurydice, I was in bed with Jeffrey and then it was like I was catapulted out of my sleep and went to the table. And the, the things I knew were, for example, I knew, oh, Jane Kenyon, I really like the way she numbers her sections, like in her poem, um, having it out with melancholy, you know, things like that. So I'll just go one, Orpheus, and once I do that, something else takes over. It's, it's very, you know, that's why I'm always amazed when, when writers say they don't believe in God or they don't believe in spirit. There's no way I can take credit for what I do. Do you know what I mean? I always feel like I'm sort of co-creating. I'm just right before I came to speak to you, I meditated. I do what I can to get out of the way. So something important comes through me and I'm, I'm not trying to manipulate it all the time. And that's a very big thing for me. I just believe in the co-creation of spirit. And that's what happens when, when I'm writing. I, um, I rely on it. And it's funny, but it is too, like no matter how many times it happens, I'm always scared to start something new and I never trust that that shadow is gonna press hard enough. And then it does, you know, and then it does. And, and the peace comes, but it's definitely some strange, mystical combination of things. That, and, you know, there's that thing, then it's done. And you look at the grapes of wrath and think, how did I do this? I don't even, how did, I was thinking, I was watching Intermittent Power last night, right? And I remembered being in Houston, I don't know, 10 years ago, when we were somehow developing Coffin in Egypt or something, it was one of my pieces. And I remember a phrase that came to me and the phrase was, 
tell me, can there be a more glorious day? And I remember sitting it down at the keyboard because I always they always have to get me a keyboard in my room wherever I go and put writing that down on the keyboard. And that was the first idea of intimate apparel. And that's the way it happens. But who knows, like who's giving it to you or why or where it's coming from? I'm just I'm grateful. I'm grateful to be the tap for that energy, because I'll tell you something. Writing can be horrifying, but having written is so <laughs> wonderful. You know that, right? Like I sit through my operas now and I just feel like I can't believe I wrote that. Like I last night was a major night for intimate apparels. Something clicked, a major thing clicked. I just felt this overwhelming. Like, how did this happen that I was eight years old and the Victor Book of Opera fell off from the shelf at Mrs. Fox, my piano teacher's house, and here I am opening two operas in New York City. How did that happen? Like, how? And I was even thinking about talking to you today, and I was thinking about how every Saturday of my childhood, because you grew up in the city, so I grew up like 40 minutes from the city. Every Saturday, I came into the city with my library card. I went to the Lincoln Center Library for the Performing Arts, and I was only interested in taking out operas that were written in the 20th century or musicals, but not like more musicals that were towards what I was interested in, you know, and, and art songs. Every art song by Ned Roram, by, I knew every American composer, every vocal piece. I mean, I knew operas like The Wish by George Anthal, like the, um, like the Dress by Leo Hoiby. I, or Mark Bucci. I knew, I knew operas by people. I was a huge fan of an opera called Double Trouble by Richard Mohawk. Fred, I knew I was such a geek. Like I knew everything. I knew that's, and it, you know, and it's, it's your irrepressible urge towards what interests you that makes you who you are. Like nobody had to tell me, go do that. That was what I was going to do. If I had a, when I was, I was about to be bar mitzvah and I was, I had my training for my Haftorah that day. It was 1968 and it was a huge snowstorm, like a dreadful snowstorm. And we lived in Long Island and I had one ticket to see Roberta Peters in Lucia de Lammermoor at the Met. And baby, I was going. I did not care what my parents said. I ran away from home. I got on the one train that left from Island Park that day. And I saw Roberta Peters in um, Lucia de Lamour and got completely stranded in the Met and called my sister Sheila crying from the Empire Hotel and said, I can't get home. And she called her friend Leslie Coppell, who came and picked me up at the Empire Hotel and took me to her apartment. I was 12. Like nobody has to tell you to be who you are. You just are. And you somehow go towards this inevitable destiny. And then you're 65 and you're like, oh, my God, I'm here. I got here. And, and then you're there and nobody can really take it from you. I mean, like no critic can trash you enough to take you away from what you, what you invented. You know, you can be revered, you can be reviled, but I am Ricky Ian Gordon today, like it or not. Well, what you just said raises so many questions. I'll see if I can bring them all to you. Please. But th the first one is why why were you attracted to those 20th century works that you named? I mean, obviously I was attracted to opera too, but I was attracted to different repertory than the kind you named. Not that I don't like what you named, but I was much more drawn to early 19th century Italian opera. Yeah, I'll tell you, I'll tell you this thing that I don't quite understand. I had two best friends, my friend Peter Ransman, who became a big opera agent. We yep. met like when I was five. And he was the one I got into opera with. I got him into it. My sister Sheila took us to our first opera, El Trovatore at the Amato Opera. And then a guy named Arthur Levy, who's a big voice teacher, teaches Audrey McDonald and, you know, Young Hoon Lee and all those, and Charlie Castronovo. But somehow all three of us were obsessed with opera, but immediately our, change, our interests were very specific. I liked 20th century work. I immediately liked Lulu. And I immediately liked Peter Grimes. 
and Vanessa by Samuel Barber. They liked the classical stuff and each one of them had a very specific world that they were very interested in and it's subjective. I don't know how to explain it. I don't know why at like 13, I had to play Evelyn Lear screaming bloody murder at the end of Lulu over and over again. Do you know what I mean? Like, well, what, what do I know what you mean, but when you were 13 and I was 13 because we're the same age, um, Evelyn Lear was my next door neighbor. Get out of here. I worshipped her. <laughs> the address 160 West End Avenue, 12th floor. And Thomas Stewart was her husband, the baritone. Right, of course. And they were such wonderful people to me, especially Evelyn, because she was very kind. She was very mentoring. But she also had, and I mean this in the best sense, only the temperament of a real artist. And everything was very lived with Evelyn. Not fake yeah. at all but yes. very experienced. And if something was beautiful, if she liked the color of my shirt, whatever, she would enthuse in the most genuine way. And this bigness of feeling that she had and imparted, to me, I had it too, but she awakened it in me. And um, it was an yes. authenticity that yeah. she brought to everything she did. She could not be fake on the stage. Right. She was the most riveting Marie in Vodzec. The most unbelievable Lulu. If only she had got to do the third act. Yeah. Right? Yep. Now, I mean, just to digress on that, explain why. I know I know what you're saying, but talk about the second act, the third act of Lulu and Berg's death, and you talk about it. Well, it's just, it was great as a two-act opera, but then when the third act was discovered and orchestrated um, and brought to life, it was like, you always had your favorite meal. And then suddenly someone brought out like the greatest topper to that meal, like an hour and a half more of Lulu. Lulu is my favorite creation. It is not my favorite piece of music. It is not my favorite painting. It is my favorite creation. And I don't know why it never loses interest to me. What is I it about it? Every night and find something interesting in it. It, what it, is it I'll about? tell you what it's about. It's yeah. inexplicably mysterious. It, I, I cannot imagine writing. I cannot imagine being able to live with myself if I wrote it. I'd be like, don't even come near me. I am so brilliant. Like, it's so, you know, you can do what you do and you can work every day at what you do, but there will always be these Mount Everests that you're like, how did they do that? That's Lulu for me. It fascinates me from the first note to the last note. It just like, and I love that feeling. Like I love, you know, the pieces of music I love. Like when you asked me to send you pieces of music I love, I felt like I was writing you a love letter. Like to say that I love this piece and this piece and this piece, it felt so intimate to give that to you. Do you know what I mean? And then I felt bad about all the things I left out because I love music like I love having blood in my veins or I love, I couldn't wait to give that to you. And that's how I feel about the pieces of music I love. I mean, Peter Grimes, Death in Venice, Britain's Death in Venice. I mean, there are just so many pieces that are, you live and die by them. I mean, Tony Kushner and I once had the greatest conversation and it was, it was prompted because we were at Cafe Mozart, which used to be on my corner, 70th and Mozart. And I was really pissed off that day because I had been at Barnes and Noble and on their big books, new books shelf, Fred, they didn't have Stanley Kunitz's brand new collected, new and collected poems. I was like, that is a monumental event. How could they not have that book on the shelf? And Tony and I talked about how Poetry is like this art where so few people care about it. And yet one line of poetry is powerful enough to have an entire civilization rise and fall on its footsteps. And that is the power of poetry, this art that so few people even think about. I have such a great story about poetry and Barbara Cook. So you have to ask me about that later. But I'll ask poetry, you right now. Tell me the you story about you? poetry and Barbara okay. Cook. So one day I go over, she wants me to come over and play her some of my music. And we had become really good friends 
in various anonymous programs. And um, I can say that because she's in heaven now. So I played her a bunch of songs. And, you know, at one point she goes, you know, I don't get poetry. I don't really like poetry. I was like, Barbara, that's like saying you don't like the Pacific Ocean. I said, poetry is so big, you couldn't even dip a ladle into an ounce of it and not come out with something you like. You just don't know you like poetry. So I said, sit down. And I recited a poem for her. I recited Marie Howe's great masterpiece, What the Living Do. She started to cry. She made her assistant come out and hear it. So I recited it again. About a month later, I get an email from my friend Jessica Malaski, the great singer, who's a dear friend. And she played my mother in a musical I wrote about my family called Sycamore Trees. No, not my mother, my oldest sister, Susan. So Jessica said, Ricky, you would not believe what happened at Barbara Cook's best friend. What was his Jerry? I think he was. He was her manager. He died. And at his funeral, Barbara talked about me and introducing her to poetry. And she read Marie's poem, What the Living Do. Mm -hmm. That was one of the most satisfying moments of my life, Fred, to open that window for someone like Barbara Cook to say, you don't know what you're talking about. Poetry is so bread. There's poetry for everyone. You just have to find it. And by recycle. So then she started inviting me and Kevin to her dinner parties. And at her dinner parties with Frank Rich and Alex Witchell and I'd have to like recite poems. And that was my job at the dinner party. But it's mostly, I tell that story not to name drop, but just to say that it was so satisfying to introduce her to poetry, you know? And that, and that she so got it that she had to recite a poem to memorialize the closest person in her life. Well, what you just addressed, I'm not being facetious in what I'm about to say, so take me seriously. I have issues with the Pacific Ocean. What? And the reason what are is, they? <laughs> um, I, I think all of us, every one of us, if he or she pays attention, has highly developed senses. And sometimes one sense is more developed than another. I coined a term that I use called pleasure activism, which is about how we live engaging our senses and what we learn from the engagement of our senses and how that forms intuition and memory and culture and so on. And if you were to put a glass in front of me with water from the Pacific Ocean and water from the Atlantic Ocean, I can tell you which one is which. And to me, the Atlantic smells much better than the Pacific. And that's just me. Because you're an Easterner. I mean, I love the I love the topography of the Pacific. Nothing wrong with that, but there's a particular slightly oily smell to the Pacific, whereas the Atlantic, and you grew up on Long Island, yes, has a briny, salty smell. It's a very different smell. I totally agree. And I'm totally much agree. more at home in the North Atlantic than I am anywhere on the Pacific. Although I've spent a lot of time in the Pacific, but I mention this because. I think what you're talking about and what I certainly experience is the degree to which we are open, living, feeling beings, we humans, but mm -hmm. so many of us are cut off from those feelings. Uh, we were talking about Evelyn Lear before and how connected she was to her feelings. And it's not about, quote, being emotional, but it's about being sensitive in, this, in the idea that we are using our senses. Yes. And it leads me back to something you said earlier that I wanted to ask you about. When that rush comes, when you suddenly bolt in bed or have an idea in the shower or in the middle of the desert, you suddenly have to do it. And we put out our original product, let's call it. Not a great word, but you know what I mean? Yeah. What happens then if you go back and look at whatever the original creation was and you think either this is the greatest thing and I can't touch it, or gee, this really needs work. How does something that is born in you with all of this explosion live on and evolve as it becomes a work that you're honing and refining and creating? Michelangelo would take marble and 
keep buffing and changing and so on for years. Yes. And yes. he was seldom satisfied with what he did. You're you're an architect, right? Like I would say, I I would say I'm an architect. And what I put out, when one of those explosions, when one of those explosions happens, it's the first draft on the marble. But it's the first draft on the marble. Then there is something, there is the architecture, there's the sense of craft in you that begins really deciding what goes, what stays, what needs to be sharp, what needs to be blunt, what needs to, a whole other thing happens that is craft and um it doesn't always like when you said that thing about the shower it made me laugh Fred because there are two songs of mine one is a song called an old-fashioned song it's a setting of a John Hollander poem that John Hollander poem I took out from the New York Times and I taped to my piano and it just sat there for about a year and one day I went into the shower and I heard the entire song and I had to run out of the shower and write it down. Another one was, there's a song of mine called We Will Always Walk Together that actually Lucas Meacham just recorded on his new CD so beautifully. I had written another version of that song and I'm in the shower and then I heard the version that exists now and I had to run out. So those things, water, water is a great conductor for ideas. I just want to say that to you. But so those were right. They were literally there was nothing to change about them. But most times, especially when you're talking about something like Green Sneakers and, and Orpheus and Eurydice, anything I've written the libretto to, where your sense of drama, your sense of theater takes over and you're addressing a million things. You're addressing tempo. You're addressing variety. You're addressing um, what, where you need the most heat, where you need to pull back. What is it? What is an up moment? What is a behind moment? What is foreground? What is background? I mean, that's where craft comes in. And I do think in a way that's what separates the men from the boys is because anyone can get an idea. It's about what you do with it. And I'm not even patting myself on the back for what I do with it. I'm just saying that's where it gets hard. You know? That, that I know when something's done. You don't always know when something's done. Like, for example, every time I watch work, the theater is a forever drifting and morphing um, entity. And I can't watch a piece of mine in the theater and I think, oh, I want to change this. I want to change. Just this morning, I, I wrote to everybody. I was like, I have one bar I need to change <laughs> in intimate apparel. But for some reason, things like Green Sneakers, um, there is still something about those pieces that explode out of you that have a sense of beginning, middle, and end. Um, with Orpheus and Eurydice, something really weird happened where we, we ran at Lincoln Center, we won the Obie Award, but then um, there was a production in a swimming pool um, out that Long Beach Opera did this beautiful production that Andreas Midisek directed in a swimming pool. And I was watching it and I suddenly thought, oh my God, I, I never wrote the disappearance music. I didn't write music for her to disappear to. And it didn't, we didn't need it at Lincoln Center. But suddenly when it was being done in places like outdoor cemeteries and swimming pools, I was like, we need music for her to disappear to. So you can't not watch these things and think I can make that better. In 27, I watched Elizabeth Futrell cross the stage as I was watching a run through and thought, she needs something to sing as she crosses Did the she stage. play Alice? She was Alice. And yes. Stephanie Blythe was Gertrude. Was Gertrude, yes. yes. And they were magnificent. They were. That's another thing, man. You just feel so lucky, Fred, too. Not everyone. I'm in love with singers. Singers, to me, are the miracle makers. I can't even believe that they can do what they do. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so... If I had to say, if you gave me the one reason I do what I do, because, you know, my mother was a singer and I was in love with my mother, just like clearly you're in love with your mother. That, I mean, get along. I get in love with, <laughs> you know, I would say that she's highly important to you. We might even be talking Greek mythology. So the thing is, I, my mother was a singer. 
And I fell in love with singing and the idea of singers. So I need to give singers special things to do. Like I want to give them, every time I give them a song, I want it to make them sound great. I want, to, I want them to be able to bear something of themselves in my work. Like I can't wait, you know, when you see Intimate Power, I really feel like, of course I did it with Lynn, but we really created great roles for singers. And I feel the same way about Fusion. So again, many things. I want to shout out to my late father who's been gone for 26 years. I'm much more like him. He was the musician. We kind of look alike. Temperamentally, we're very much alike. Um, and people who knew him always say the degree to which I'm really like Edward Plotkin. Um, oh, so much so that when you see baby pictures of him, it looks like me. And um, I say this because number one, I miss him, but number two, part of who we are as creative people comes from the people who inspired us, it's kind of obvious, but um, they change as they recede into history. Yes. And they change because the reality of their lives, he lived from 1923 to 1996, was a very specific time frame. So about dad who loved music and was a wonderful musician from the beginning, his favorite composers were Gershwin, Stravinsky, Debussy, Ravel, Duke Ellington, the people whose, and Puccini to some degree, the people whose music he heard when he was a small boy. Yeah. So yeah. that by that extension, you and I being born in 1956, I don't know who we would say we were drawn to, but I know that for me, it was Haydn, it was Rossini, it was Berlioz, it was people like that, who I was not necessarily exposed to, but those were the first pieces of music that grabbed me and held me and made me want to know more. Maybe you were grabbed and held by the music of different composers when you were a very small child. Well, you know, do you know, um, this, I have a big, um, an article that came out a couple of months ago for it. I wrote like this 8,000 word piece on Joni Mitchell. I was, because I had three older sisters and my oldest sister was a very well-known journalist and wrote about music. Um, I was really into the, the composer I loved growing up. First of all, my first gift from my uncle Sid was the score of Porgy and Bess. He worked on the subways. He found the score, he gave it to me. And soon after that, he got an eye disease where he was seeing double and he was hit by a subway and he was killed. So like, Sid left with Porgy and Bess. I loved Porgy and Bess, but I loved Joni Mitchell, The Beatles, Neil Young, The Rolling Stones, um, The Doors. I liked all of that and I liked it as much as I liked Das Rheingold and Lulu and Double Trouble and, you know, Minotti. And so, and I never had something that said serious music, not serious music. It was all music to me. I think Leonard Bernstein said when he said, there's only two kinds of music, good music and bad music. The only thing well, I would change, what? My dad told me, because he quoted that, but it was not Bernstein, it was Duke Ellington. The Duke oh. Ellington always said there are two types of music, good music and the other kind. Well, here's the thing, but how <laughs> do you know it's subjective? Yeah, I loved the music I loved. So I think it was all great music. Some people don't, you know what I mean? This, it's so subjective and that's what's great about it too. You know, I, Stephen Sondheim, when he came along, I mean, he changed the rules. And, you know, this is in this article in the Times today, I said this, but. By the Stephen way, I'm Sondheim, told, I haven't seen it yet, but I'm told that there's a profile of Ricky in today's New York Times. I've not yet read it. So everyone oh, go to NewYorkTimes.com and read it. It has good pictures. But the thing <laughs> is, a lot of us thought Stephen Sondheim was an open door into what a lot of us wanted to do, but he wasn't. He was an aberration and the door was big enough for him to walk through, not anybody else. So we have all had to make our own ways. And the way I made my way was that I thought I was gonna make it in the musical theater, but I had, when I wrote My Life with Albertine and thought this is what I wanna do in the musical theater. And we had very strange and in some ways 
not very wonderful critical reception. And I thought, I'm, I need to get out of the musical theater because if I can't do what I need to do here, then I don't want to be in it. And that's when I started writing opera and really taking off because in opera, I can do what I do, you know? But yeah, that's Stephen Sondheim. He's that these people come along and they carve another hole in you, you know? They carve another space in you to interpret the world differently. So you were talking about singers who inspire you and you love, and I, I feel that 100%. Do you ever compose a song cycle or an opera with a specific singer in mind? Oh, my and God. And he or he become the inspiration, even if you don't work with that person. I, when I'm writing, often envision someone but ultimately that may not be the person who does it, but I envision it as a way in to form the character, form the issues. And then it goes where it goes. I mean, that it happens so often, but like two big examples are, for example, when Audrey McDonald came along, um, when I heard Audrey's voice, which was in Carousel, I had that thing that people who grow up on opera get when everything in you says, world-class, once-in-a-lifetime singer. Like, that is the kind of voice that will go from planet to planet, from solar system to solar system, and they will make that kind of um, impact. And immediately, Audra had found out about me from Arthur Levy and from Harold and Blackwell's CD, Genius Child. And Audra started singing my music. And for a while, she was the only singer I could write for. She was the voice in my head for a little while. Lorraine Hunt was a friend of mine. Really good example. When Jeffrey died, my, uh, my partner died from AIDS in 1996. And really, my world fell apart. Like, that is all there is to say about it. He was the grand finale to a, a prolonged period of grief that was so catastrophic for me that I just fell apart. And one element of my healing was one day I started writing a song cycle called Late Afternoon. It was Ned Roram had commissioned a few of us composers to write cycles for the West Side Y, I mean the 92nd Street Y, and he would present us. And the way I healed writing that cycle was I heard Lorraine in my head singing it. And she was supposed to premiere it. But one night I went to see um, uh, Mozart, Sesto, uh, you know, Clemenza, uh, Clemenza de, de Tito. Tito. And Lorraine was in it. And I went backstage and she called me into her dressing room and said, literally, she said, my breasts are filled with lumps. Yeah. So she ended up touring a concert tour and she sang two of the song cycles, but then died before she could premiere it. Um, so Maggie Lattimore premiered it and recorded it and she was magnificent. But just hearing Lorraine's voice in my head and writing the songs was healing to me. Um, that's, that's the way it is now. I, I hear singers and I have to try to get them for what I do. But if I can't get them, they still are. When I wrote Ma Jode, I wrote it for Lorraine. Lorraine was no longer alive. Deanne Meek premiered it. Deanne Meek was like the closest thing to Lorraine Hunt I've ever heard in my life. And on every level, her, her ability to be truthful on stage. And I mean, truthful, like she would be a pain in the ass about something. Like there was some line in her, she had this aria called us and it would get to the slime. She goes, oh, look, here's a vase. That's us. And she would look at Michael Corey and me every time she sang it and go like, a vase, a vase, like, what is this line about? I knew exactly what it was about. But finally, Michael Corey went home and he changed the line to a child's lock of hair. That's us. She sang it. She started to cry and she said, thank you. She could not sing that line without being authentic and she couldn't make it mean anything. The, those are the artists. They will... They'll badger you until you give them what they need to be authentic on the stage and deep and beautiful and magnificent. Lorraine Hunt Lieberson 
when she she had a prolonged battle with breast cancer, she died at 52, began to perform a Bach cantata, Ich hab genug, I've had enough, that was staged by Peter Sellers, S-E-L-L-A-R-S. And it was very graphic, not in a way that was abusive, but graphic musically, graphic theatrically. It was not overdone, but it just it found yeah. the elements of that cantata in the words and the music that she connected to in particular ways because she was fighting cancer and died. I, I, you know, she was supposed to work on something at the Met that I was involved in. And I remember that James Levine was so enthusiastic about that he gave, it was Orfeo actually, yes. that he gave sort of a, a fist bump um, with the idea of working with her. She was that kind of inspiring artist. And so you, sorry, I hear what you're saying about writing for the voices or the spirits of people who are no longer there. And yeah, think, they're in your head. If you love yeah. singers, they're in your head. And you look at a character and you think, this. I mean, everyone asks in, in Intimate Apparel, like Lynn Kirsten, who plays Esther, they were like, who are you thinking of? I said, Lynn Tim Price. Yeah. That's what's in my head for the entire, Lynn Tim Price is Esther. Luckily, we got Kirsten Piper Brown, who is magnificent and might as well be Lynn Tim Price. But I always hear singers in my head. Always, always, always. Yeah, they're, they're my biggest inspiration. I really love them. I'm so amazed when people are rude to singers. It's like oh, I know. opera doesn't exist without them. And also when people write on social media thinking that singers are not on social media and don't see what they're saying. And to me, that's just stunning. It's really... Um, it's a life. Well, do it so hard. Yeah. I mean, right now with COVID, we have had numerous singers test positive. I know. Um, and I would never say who they are, but a lot of times now they're just putting it out on the internet that I have tested positive and I'm doing okay and so on. But earlier in the pandemic, when there were not vaccines, singers I knew died and, and a dear conductor friend of mine died of COVID. And Joel Revson, I want to name him. Oh, I loved Joel Revson. Yeah, Joel was a magnificent conductor and man. And person, yeah. And person, yeah. And we worked together quite a lot. And, but there, there was a tenor, I'm not going to name him because he was not public about it, who nearly died. And, you know, may have long COVID and so on. The physical act of being out there singing is is a challenge in normal times, but now with, with this, it's something greater. Ricky, typically in these conversations, I don't talk to my guests too much about COVID, but given that you are rehearsing and about to present two operas, which is, I mean, Wagner and Verdi didn't do that. <laughs> the no. closest Verdi got was he was working on Traviata and Trovatore more or less at the same time. But that's about it. They premiered a year apart. And um, I mean, maybe Rossini and Donizetti, there was a little more overlap. But still, in our contemporary times where fewer operas are produced, new works, where we're battling a pandemic, where New York City, resilient though we are, has had real challenges in terms of illness, in terms of getting people into theaters, Talk a bit about this particular additional layer that you all have been in the face of and how it's affected rehearsals and maybe in positive ways. I don't know, but talk about that. Okay, I'm going to be really honest, though, okay? Well, so we were three weeks into previews, March 12th, 2020, when every theater closed. And we were, by the way, the last theater to close because our theater, they thought, was small enough to keep open. For intimate apparel. Yes, at the Lincoln yeah. Center Theater. Right. And I was like, do not keep our theater open. Close it. Because it was so dispiriting. For every preview, we would be listed as sold out and there would be less people. I remember John Corleano and Mark Adamo came one night and 
they were so masked. John was so afraid to get it. And it was like, I just couldn't bear seeing less and less people there. I was like, you don't want to open an opera in the spirit of everybody's going to die. Let's go to, let's go to the opera. It was so, <laughs> so we closed. Yep. And I went and, you know, everything like Renee Fleming and Patrick Summers were supposed to do my Grapes of Wrath in Aspen that summer. I mean, I had so many things canceled, baby. I just was like, okay, I am done. So I go upstate. That this is a side note. I started a writing group. I told, I wrote a memoir. I got a book contract from Jonathan Galassi and Farris Strauss and Giroux. So I made something of that period. But then I come back to New York where this collision happens where both of them are done, being done at the same time. But when I first got here on January 3rd, Omicron was peaking. And I'm gonna tell you something. All I could think, Fred, was I hope they just cancel them again and I can get the hell out of this disease riddled city. I didn't wanna do my operas. I didn't even wanna walk the streets. I didn't even feel like I wanted to live. I just felt like I've worked decades on these pieces and this is when they're gonna premiere when no one wants to even go out of their house. Lynn was doing MJ, her piece about Michael Jackson. It was sold out and then all of a sudden they had to close. And it was just like a, such a diseased feeling about everything. I felt sick, but amazingly, and we had to delay Finzi Contini's because someone in the cast would test positive. And then for 10 days, they'd be out. Like it was just, it was one day, you couldn't tell from one day to the next. And I mean, in both places, we would be tested every day, wearing the masks. I couldn't get rid of this cough. I felt like the world was one big disease. But then slowly through January, people started coming out. More and more people started coming. Like the previews, every night we have more people at Intimate Apparel. We're almost sold out. Finzi continues is almost sold out. Like what happened? All I can say is one day at a time, one moment at a time. But it seems like it's waning a little bit and people are ready to go out again. And the audience is at least we're not open at Finzi Contini, but Intimate Apparel, they seem so appreciative. Like just, oh my God, just happy to be in a theater. So it's getting better. It's getting better. But I didn't really, at first, I just thought, just cancel them. I'll have to, I'll just be a dead composer. And one day people will discover those operas. You know what I mean? That'll be better than this, you know? But now it's turning around and I'm just I, I'm just grateful and really grateful one moment at a time, because who knows, another variant could come. And it's just but it's been a happy few days. I'm glad it's been a happy few days. Um, I want to ask you a delicate question. And if you don't want to answer, I fully understand it. You could just Please. say next. OK, yeah. You and I are the same age. I discover we're born five days apart. And we lived through the 1980s and 90s when AIDS was everywhere and was a pandemic. It was different in that there were social judgments imposed on people who were diagnosed with AIDS, mm -hmm. that they were gay or they were drug users, whatever negative social values were applied to them. And that was awful. And a lot of it came from our government and it came from certain religious institutions. Not all, many religious institutions were wonderfully responsive and caring. Um, and when in our lifetimes we live through this kind of thing twice, I'm not asking about personal lives, I'm asking about creativity. I'm asking about how it affects our sense of needing, wanting to get something work published and completed quickly or letting it gestate. And, and because for people of our age group who lived in New York City during a first plague, it, and then there were people, frankly, in our age group, we could have gotten polio. We just yeah. should have qualified for that. Right. So right. these things are ongoing. And Sometimes it creates an urgency about creation. Sometimes it fosters a, a sense of being stymied. And could you talk about 
the creative urge that we've been talking about, but with the shadow of epidemics around the creative urge? That's a really good question because I, I obviously I discovered something very big about myself during that time um, in terms of who I am as an artist, which is, like I remember, do you remember William Parker, you know, the baritone? Yeah. Yeah. So remember he did the AIDS quilt songbook and he came to me and asked me if I would write something. And there was a book, my friend Michael Klein edited this book of, it was called um, the AIDS quilt songbook and they were poems, but I wrote my own. And it was a song called, I never knew. And it began, I never knew when I dreamed of holding all these men that there would be so little time for that embrace or that desire would end in such a way I never knew. And I really wrote about what, what it meant to me and what was happening around me. And he put me last and he asked me if I would come out and speak that poem and then play it and Kurt Ullman sang it. It was such a deep moment for me, Fred, because Everything turned around. I realized that my topic was grief. Like Stanley Kunitz, what was his topic? Right before he was born, his father in a public park shot himself in the head with a rifle. The main topic of Stanley Kunitz's poem is the death of this father he never met. You read one of his most famous poems, The Portrait. It's about a portrait of that man. For me, the AIDS, AIDS happened in the dead center of my life. And grief became so pervasive. Every day was a memorial service. Every day was someone dying. Every day was someone I went into. I got sober in 1989. The, the AA meetings at that time, people were dying once a week, twice a week. Everybody was dying. It was like, it was so surreal. And then finally, I fell in love with Jeffrey and Jeffrey died. When he died, that was it. It was like a dam burst in me. And I had so much grief to express. I mean, you look at 10 years of my work and all you see is grief, 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 including the Grapes of Rap, which by the way, hello, is like the grand grief novel. And so that's what it did for me. It shaped and honed me into, I am not the same person I was, you know, before 1980 when my friend Daniel Katz was one of the first people to die of AIDS. And then everybody, one by one by one by one by one. I mean, I talk about it in my book. There's a moment when, remember Teresa Stratus is doing rags on Broadway. And one of my dearest friends, Mark Fotopoulos is in it. And he invites me to a matinee and then we're gonna go out afterwards. I loved him and I had a crush on him. I was thinking, I have to go out and sleep together. So anyway, we, we go. Um, I go, he takes me backstage to meet Teresa Stratus, but there's a note on her door and it says, I love you all. If you love me, you'll leave me alone. So we don't meet her. But then I go into the lobby and Mark and I are standing there. And I see a little, little tiny spot on his nose right here. And I remember like, you know, that thing that comes over you like, it's like a kind of nausea. You're going to faint the hair on the back of your neck. Like to, I knew immediately, oh my God, Mark's going to die. And he did. And that was how it was. You didn't know, like you knew, you knew that no one was going to get treatment. Nothing was going to work. Whether Ronald Reagan said it or not, or came up with studies or treatment or anything. At that time, it just meant a death sentence. And that's what it was. And you spent all your time at memorial services and in the hospital with your friends who had thrush and just the whole thing. So maybe by the, by the time that was over and by the time Jeffrey died, I was just like, okay, no longer Ricky Ian Gordon of the eighties. I'm a new person. And I have never turned back. That is, that's the inner resource I go to when I have to write. It was, it was God's terrible gift to me. Do you 
take that more now as a responsibility or a mission? Do you feel, you know, I don't know when you grew up, if you knew people who had endured the Holocaust. And I mean, I grew up around those people of and I with numbers on their arms. And I grew so up on. in a Jewish enclave. Well, I didn't necessarily. I grew up in a very mixed enclave with all kinds of people from everywhere. But some of the Jews I knew had been people who were rescued or survived or whatever. And they they felt they had to bear, some felt they had to bear witness. Others just could not bring themselves to ever talk about it. And if you were with them and you knew about that, I, I find it's kind of the same thing now with COVID. I found it with AIDS. Um, it used to be with cancer that that was something you just didn't talk about. And, um, but nonetheless, it fell to artists to understand it and express it, maybe not as literal representation, but as the emotional component of what those things meant to the people involved. It's, it's funny, Fred. I don't know why. What you're saying is making me realize something. Because I was thinking about Finzi Continues, and then I, I think, but wait a minute. Go all the way back. Now, you know, when I was a little boy, I became obsessed with foreign film. And I mean, when I say obsessed, like I could run the Lincoln Center Film Society. I mean, like I knew every Bergman movie, every- That's my assistant, Ricky. <laughs> oh, oh, like every, every single- I know. Every Al Renee movie, Truffaut, Yasujiro Ozu, Satyajit Ray. I was a nut. Like the, it was opera and foreign film. Now, I think about it. Why and yesterday was Fellini's birthday, which to me is a holiday. Yeah. Oh my God, completely. Yeah. Right? Yep. And I was thinking, why was I always obsessed with such sort of dark? And I think it might be because of the tribe I came from. Like it was just inherent in them. I mean, my grandmother escaped Poland on the day her town was wiped off the map. She talked about women's breasts being cut off, like out in the street. Um, it was so morbid and upsetting to hear about and constant. And I think that is just in me. And, and I, I suppose I've always, I, I said this, it's in the time state, but I did, I want to say this. Creating for me, I always just wanted to make things that were as resonant and as um, harrowing and as unsettling as foreign movies. I wanted my operas, my musicals to feel like foreign films. I think that's why the failure of my life with Albertine was so devastating to me, because to me, it felt like my Truffaut movie on, on stage. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It really had, I was 100% proud of it. I thought me and Richard Nelson had created a thing of beauty. And when people didn't get it, I was just like, then I don't want to be in the theater. Fuck you. You know, I just was like, then I don't belong here. Um, but yeah, I think that I've always been that person. And yes, we have we have Holocaust in our veins. I mean, it's just it's everywhere. It's like my entire my relatives, Russia, Poland, Romania, and nothing but despair. And some dancing on plates. But I was about to say, and humor is yeah. the other side of that. And it's fascinating how humor is a corrective it's you know sometimes a very morbid corrective um i can think of times in my life when things were really grim and humor is what got either me through or my using humor with other people at very grim times um and <laughs> the kind the direction our conversation is taking ricky is quite something but i'm very happy because what we're talking about is aesthetics and yes. it's really not necessarily framed that way. And so I'm going to go to a different question. I wish I could remember the name of the film by Lars von Trier that starred Bjork and Catherine Deneuve. It's called uh, a dance, a Dancer in the Dark. Dancer in the Dark, thank you. Yeah. And what is very particular about that film to me is it is genuine tragedy. And most modern works of art 
may have tragic or sad elements, but are not genuine tragedies. And the cathartic experience that I had watching that film was quite something because some the fact that it was tragedy, but not my tragedy, somehow number one connected me to a level of humanity that thankfully I'm not exposed to every day. But on the second hand, it brought me out of a certain kind of funk and despair because you could see how people can be resilient or not. I mean, you know, it's like someone I know who died not too long ago said, until I'm really sick and dying, I'm not sick and dying. I'm just lying. I mean, over until it's over. Yeah. And, um, you know, I remember thinking of Pope John Paul II, not necessarily one of my heroes, but remarkable in his way, because he opposed end of life choice and believed that suffering, visible suffering, was part of life. And I respect that about him and mm -hmm. the choice that he made. I would just argue with him if he wanted to, that he made his choice, but other people should be entitled to their choices. But the question is tragedy. And whether we are sanitizing tragedy in modern life, even though it exists everywhere, and people experience it silently and often violently is their response to that. Um, and the role of an artist in going deep on the issue of tragedy and bringing it forth. I, I think it's, that is really interesting. Everything you just said and the way you phrased it. And I would say this, first of all, you know, I do think Garden of the Finzi Continues is a genuine tragedy. I think that, um, and what's tragic about it is that against, that it's really just the story about unrequited love and about desire traveling the wrong way in a thousand directions but against a backdrop of catastrophe. And that makes the human element so sad because no matter what happens, whether this person gets who they want or that person gets who they want, they're all gonna die anyway and they're gonna die horrible deaths. And they're not gonna be in their fancy family crypts or anything. They're gonna be buried God knows where. Um, but what I will say is this, that if I, if I do think there's something sad about the notion of tragedy and the, the life we live in, the world we live in right now, is that I think people are terminally distracted. And if you're terminally distracted, you cannot commit yourself to what a tragedy represents because you're distracted. And I think it's why the government is the way, I think everything is the way it is right now because people are so happily amused on their own. They don't have time to object. They don't have time to demonstrate. They don't have time to cry. They don't have time to rail against. They don't have time to celebrate. They only have time to check their email, to check their social media, to take their selfies. I do think it's a genuine tragedy and I'm glad I wasn't born in this a generation where that is all they have because for like it or not, as for as painful as it was, I'm glad to be able to celebrate the tragic in myself and the tragic in life. And that, it scares me, it genuinely scares me. Um, and Neil Postman wrote a book about it a long time ago, a really prescient book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. That guy was onto something because that's what I think is happening. I think the reason you don't see Millions and millions of Democrats out in the street protesting the fact that we are entering an autocracy is because they don't have to. They're busy. They're busy reading their email. That's how I feel about it. But also the sense of protest often comes with people posting something online that they want to vent about rather than actually doing something about Which it. Which is not doing anything. But I also think that I'm talking about American society in this case, and I know yeah. we have listeners around the world, that we don't learn enough in our country about civics and how our government works and what we are to expect from our government. And therefore, true. we don't demand something else. I will only add, Ricky, that um, 
I think a big change happened around the time of Ronald Reagan when globalization came about and there was a commodification of technology. In other words, everyone could afford a television set and a, and yes. a VCR video cassette recorder. So suddenly they were in effect tamed. They were kept in by watching a screen. Yes. Uh, I, for one, am not a big screen per. I love cinema, yes, but I don't watch operas on screen. I don't watch concerts on screen. I don't oh, I hate them. Yeah, yeah. Because those are live events. Yes. But cinema is made for the screen and therefore it's a different thing. Yeah. Ricky, let's go to the Garden of the Finzi Contini. Okay. You use the English language title. Um, the book was by Giorgio Bassani, Il Giardino dei Finzi Contini. Right. And yes. I knew Giorgio Bassani. I studied with Giorgio Bassani. Get out of here. Because I studied at the University of Bologna and he was from Ferrara. And he lived in Rome a lot, but he also, he had a long death of Alzheimer's. But I studied with him because here was this man who wrote a very famous novel that became a very famous film. But it was really one of the first times that anti-Semitism in Italy was addressed in art. Yes. And he was right out there about that. But it was also about the self-delusion of the wealthy, protected characters, the Finzi Contini family, Micole, the, the beautiful young woman. Um, they lived a certain kind of, and this is not a negative term, bourgeois lifestyle in Ferrara, which is a very beautiful city. Beautiful. I lived in Bologna a half hour from Ferrara right. and went to Ferrara a lot because Ferrara was one of the centers of the Italian resistance. And there's a great museum of there. There's also a museum of the Risorgimento, the movement that formed the unification of Italy in the 19th century. And Bassani was a piece of work, as we say in English. He was kind of a tough character, not in a bad way, but he was molto schietto, as the Italians say. He just was very serious and frank and candid and was not about manners and Bella Figura, not to say he was rude, but he was just essential, I think is the right word. It sounds like, uh, when I read him, he sounds like the Billy Goat Gruff. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and as he got older, he became more impatient because I think he felt, number one, his time was slipping. I don't think he had a foreshadowing of his Alzheimer's, which was very profound in his case. Um, but I also think that he felt that the message of his writing had been forgotten. Wow. Even though it was a very popular book and later a, a film, because I think he felt that it can happen again. Mm -hmm. And that the tragedy that befell the Finzi Contini family was not just about evil around them, but their blindness and deafness to the realities of the world. Yes. So how did you first thing to write an opera based on this novel and talk about the process. Okay, so I grew up in Island Park, Long Island, like we said, the town before Long Beach. And one night when I was 15, I took the train to East Rockaway where the, there was a movie theater and I went to see the movie, the DeSica movie. And the movie had a very strange effect on me. Obviously it shook me up. But really the effect it had on me was it had this sense of like quintessential foreign art film, meaning it was so, it was like, it was like a jewel was installed in me. And it felt like the most important jewel in a very serious necklace. And then I started seeing that movie like every five years and it always satisfied something inexplicable in me. And then what happened was Michael Corey and I, after we did Grapes of Wrath, Minnesota Opera wanted us to do our next project for them. Grapes of Wrath was very successful for them and it enabled their new works program and they wanted us to do something else. And so we were looking for a project. And one night I was walking home on 72nd Street and Kevin and I were sort of new in our relationship. And I was 
there was a video store and I thought, I wonder if Kevin's ever seen Garden of the Things You Can Tease. So I rented that movie and I brought it home. And that night I had a reaction to that movie I had never had before. I was inconsolable at the end of that movie. It like, it's almost like crazy. Like I was hysterical. And when it was done, I was trying to talk to Kevin about what it was. Why did I have that reaction? And I never so saw the separation between what was actually happening in the world and all of their personal little tragedies. Suddenly the smallness of human beings in the face, it just all hit me so hard that night. And I, I went into the next room and I called Michael Corey and I said, I think I know what our next project should be. And he didn't even balk. He just said, yes. And he said, I think we should base it on the book because um, the movie is so reliant upon imagery, whereas the book fleshes out the people. And, um, and that was it. And then really that what happened is, and I can't tell that story right now, but I do tell it in the, my forthcoming book, but something sort of awful happened with Minnesota Opera and it didn't work out for them. Um, but we kept working on it, literally for years, we kept working on this opera and with no idea where it would be. Like I went to Chicago to show it to Anthony Freud. I sh showed it to every entendant in this country. And it just wasn't meant to be until one day, Michael was talking to Michael Capasso after City Opera had done a piece of his called um, Hopper's Wife. And he said, you know, Ricky and I have this opera of Garden of the Fiends and Contini's. Michael Capasso screamed. The Yiddish theater was supposed to be involved in their next commission. They came over and heard it. As soon as everyone heard it, they were like, we're doing this opera. And that was it. That was just, and it, it felt like the right moment, the right time, the right people. And that has been how it has sort of unfolded. And I'm in touch with like Portia Priebus, who was, was uh, Bassani's mistress. And like the whole Bassani world came into my world because of this setting. So it all feels very beshared. Do you know what I mean? And- um, Beshared being Italian for meant to be. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, my mother's first language is Yiddish, by the way. I'm um, Fred. But so, yeah, so that, and, and it's another one of those weird feelings of like, wow, I'm 15, I go to East Rockway, I see the movie Garden of the Fiends of Catini's, and it's, 2022 and my opera of it is about to premiere. We are so, the forces that surround us and that control us are so much bigger than we are. Do you know what I mean? Like sometimes I literally feel like a marionette, Fred. Like I am not pulling the strings. I'm pulling the strings and it's, you know, when you said about how you're more like your father than your mother, I'm like both of my parents. My mother was incredibly gregarious. I have that. But my father was incredibly disciplined. My mother would never sit down and write full length operas. I have my father's discipline and his work ethic. And I'm grateful for that. So I'm like both of them. But definitely this thing of writing operas, it is, it's big, it's hard. It's not for the faint of heart. It takes years. It takes years to get an opera right. So, um, but yeah, that's what, I didn't even know, like, what was I just addressing? I feel like I was indirectly addressing. Well, we're talking about how something lives and germinates in you, in this case, mm. part of the Finzi Contini. Yes. I have to get used to saying it plural, Finzi Contini's. No, you, I like that you say it, the, the way the Italians say it. But actually, I had a question for you about Intimate Apparel. I forgot to ask, and I want to go oh, back please. to that, and then we'll go back to the garden. Intimate Apparel, I understand, is being performed with two pianos. Mm -hmm. Is that how it was composed, or is this something new? Um, I compose on two grand staffs. So, like, I always, in a way, I'm always writing on two piano staffs, and then there's always extra staffs. Like, there'll be a staff for double bass. There'll be a staff for strings. There'll be a staff for reeds, very often a staff for, for brass. So that I'm always mock orchestrating as I go along. For one thing, because a lot of the ways that, that people hear my work is right now I'm sitting at my computer talking to you. 
when Peter Gelb and Andre Bishop heard Intimate Apparel, they sat on a piano bench right here facing my computer and my finale program played them the music to Intimate Apparel scrolling by as I sang along. So that's how I write. So these mock orchestrations help people to hear in a way what my work is gonna sound like when it's finished. So consequently, I'm always writing two piano scores and I'm a pianist, so my work is very pianistic. When we decided to do the Lincoln Center Theater rather than the Met, which is Rudolf Bing's fantasy of the mini Met, right? Because it's a Met commission and we're doing it at Lincoln Center Theater. Um, I knew it would work better on two pianos and that I could make it really rich for one thing, because even if it was a chamber orchestration, there'd be no place to put them. So you'd have to put them elsewhere and have them piped in. Because of the period, we're talking about a rooming house where there's salons all the time and there's always a piano playing. The, the idea of orchestrating for two pianos, everything about it felt right for the milieu. And then Michael Yergin built this incredible set where these two 10 foot grand pianos are floated above the stage. So the whole thing is so perfect and it sounds great in there. And when you come into that theater, you're basically seeing a big grand opera with these gigantic pianos playing and for like 300 seat theater. I, it's so thrilling to me. So yeah, that was exigency. Now St. Louis wants to premiere the version um, where it's orchestrated. And I really look forward to orchestrating it. And in particular, I would orchestrate it like a piano concerto because I would not get rid of one of the pianos. The idea of a piano on stage is right. Even if it's the piano floated above and conducted, somehow piano should be featured in this piece. So that would be a particular challenge. Finzi Contini's we orchestrated for 15 pieces, partly because of budget and because of the exigencies, but also because um, when you orchestrate for 15, it'll be easy to expand. And we already uh, are like booked into how, like there are houses in Italy interested. I think Genoa Opera wants to do it next year. So all I have to do is expand it in very simple ways and we will have the orchestration. So will you be going to Genoa? Yeah, I'm going to go wherever it goes. Okay, That's so I mean, Genoa is one of the cities I know best. I love Genoa. I will How do you know it? it? Yeah. I wrote a whole book about it. You did? Yeah. Recipes from Paradise. Life and food on the Italian Riviera. I, I think it's my best food bread. book, actually. Yeah. Um, and Wagner said that after seeing Genoa, London and Paris were dull. Genoa is a wonderful city. I only know it from, I was conducting in Monte Carlo for two months one summer and we would take the train to, to Genoa. And um, I loved it. I fell in love with that city, but I didn't spend that much time there. You would clearly have. That's the region of Italy where I live when I'm there. Wow. Fred, Which has not been for two exciting. years, but. <laughs> so you'll come see it in Genoa because you can't see it now, right? You could see it in Genoa. I, I know, I know, I know. Um, but anyway, that theater, by the way, just so you know, the Carlo Felice has one of the largest stages in Europe because the opera house was bombed during World War II and they used a cinema in Genoa um, called the Teatro Grattacello, which means the skyscraper theater. And we have a company in New York called the Teatro Grattacello, named for the one in Genoa that does mostly Verismo operas. But until 1992, the, the Teatro Grattacello was where opera was done in Genoa. They rebuilt the Carlo Felice to have a stage the size of the recently opened Garnier in Paris oh and God. the Met and so on. So the production and the Velki in, in Warsaw, so that the productions could be shared with those big theaters. So the wow. theater itself is sort of institutional looking. It's not Italy's prettiest theater because it had been destroyed. But in terms of the stage, it's rather extraordinary. Can I ask you a question? Does it have a good acoustic? Are good. Not Italy's best, but they're very good. That's not a problem. Okay. But All it's right. a broad pit. 
This oh, funny. I imagined one of those little jewel box like La Fenice. This is not, not one of them. No, this is a well. The house itself is not that big, but the stage is huge. Wow. Okay. And I say that because no. productions have to be at a certain scale, or you really have to make an enclosure to get the sound out of it. Oh, it's it, opera it, like it, absolutely. You know. Yeah. Yeah. But um. I'm switching gears yet again. That's okay. I want to talk to you about your opera, Ellen West, mm. which was done. I, I saw it. I believe it was done elsewhere before it came to the Saratoga. Right. I saw it right. at the Prototype Festival in Brooklyn. Beth Morrison was my guest a few months ago here, and she's just been named by the Kennedy Center one of the 50 top opera le uh, cultural leaders in America. Yeah. And she is. I know. And so. Ellen West, talk about it. Fascinating story and great music and talk about that opera. When Jeffrey first died in 1996, um, I was led in many different directions, but because so many of my friends are poets and writers, I was led towards literature. And at one point I discovered a poem by a poet named Frank Bedore that moved me so deeply, I sought him out. And I, I went to read this, and it was a little poem. It was called The Yoke. May I say it for you? Yep. So it's called The Yoke. Don't worry, I know you're dead. But tonight, turn your face again toward me. When I hear your voice, there is now no direction in which to turn. I sleep and wake and sleep and wake and sleep and wake and... But tonight, turn your face again toward me. See, upon my shoulders is the yoke, which is not a yoke. Don't worry, I know you're dead, but tonight, Turn your face again. I don't know what it, the simplicity of that poem. I, I could not stop. I, it just it, the mysteriousness of it. The I sleep and wake and sleep and wake and and I became obsessed with Frank Bedard and his universe. When I found Ellen West, he had written three persona poems. One was called. Um, uh, one was called Nijinsky, The War of Vaslav Nijinsky. One was called Herbert White, which is a poem about a serial murderer. One of the most graphic, horrifying poems I've ever read in the form of a monologue. And then there was Ellen West. Ellen West was one of the most harrowing and moving things I had ever read. For one thing, I in my entire life have dealt with eating disorder issues. I just did. I grew up Growing up on Long Island, I joke about it and I say, like, if if Jesus Christ was in, in a room full of, you know, women from Long Island and men, the, the greatest thing they could possibly say to him was, you look thin. You look like you lost a few. That is that's my inner inner life like and so <laughs> the idea of weight. OK, I have a lot of issues. Or I would say. Hummus again? <laughs> Just, exactly, there, that, yeah, but it has to be about weight. So I read Ellen West and I was like, no one ever got this issue with greater depth yeah. than Frank Bedard. Not even, not even that, you know, he, he was inspired by, um, uh, by that, the book, The Case of Ellen West, by that, the therapist, Binghoffer, I just forgot his name for the moment. Binswanger, Ludwig Binswanger. Ludwig, Ludwig, Ludwig Binswanger. So I become obsessed with that poem. And in particular, there are a few lines from that poem. At the very end, when Ellen West is about to commit suicide, she writes a letter to her friend who's still in the hospital. And she says, dearest, I remember how at 18 on hikes with friends when they rest, rested sitting down to joke or talk 
I circled around them, afraid to hike ahead alone, yet afraid to rest, for I was not yet truly thin. That really resonated with me. I mean, you know, it's not, I'm not, I don't hide that I was a drug addict. I was an alcoholic and I had eating issues. And one of my major issues was that I took speed all the time so I wouldn't eat. So it lived inside of me and I knew one day I was going to do something with it. And that is a problem because you never know when that voice is going to say the time is now. So I was working on an opera for Houston Grand Opera called The House Without a Christmas Tree, and which has nothing to do with eating disorders. And it's, it's a an children's opera. opera. Yes, yes. With, it's really a family opera that I wrote with Royce yeah. Fabric. And, um, and I'm on a train one day and it's like, uh-oh, it's time to do Ellen West. I, don't, I just knew it. So I wrote a letter to Frank Bedard. I found his email on the like, Wellesley website or something. And I told him that I, who I was, and I felt this need to set the poem to music. And he wrote back a really nice letter right away. Um, at that time, I was going to write it for Joyce Di Donato. And, and um, I, he might have been a fan of hers, but he said, absolutely. And I, um, so I got the rights from Farrah Strauss and Drew, from Jonathan Galassi, who now I'm writing for. And um, I was in Houston working on House of Their Christmas Tree. But I would get up at four in the morning and work on Ellen West. Such different heads. But that's, there was something about that dark, like four in the morning is sort of the Sylvia Plath hour. I mean, that's when she would write her poems when, when her little kids were asleep, right? Nicholas and um, Flora. So I came back to New York after that, and I was almost done with this opera. And I had already approached Beth. Once I knew I wanted to do it, I approached Beth Morrison. And I said, I think this would be a good piece for you. Because I knew I wanted to do something with Beth. I was such an admirer. And I thought, this chick is really onto something. And she said, absolutely. But then Larry, um, Larry Edelson heard about it and wanted to do it at Opera Saratoga first and premiere it. So when I came back to New York, I had almost the whole thing. The only thing that I would say about it is, it prompted sort of, not like, not an, I don't want to say nervous breakdown, but that is, I, I went into a deep depression. And that's when I had to start antidepressants. It, it triggered something in me. And, but it also feels really deep to me. Like, it was like, wow, did I need to write that score? And it, Everything about it, like Fred, when you said about my relationship with writers, I mean, Frank was a writer that I admired like he was Socrates, okay? And meanwhile, I knew when I was done setting it to music, I knew I have a classical tragedy on my hands and I need a prologue and I need an epilogue. And I literally had the balls to write to him and say, I think I need this. And at first I took the yoke and I made the yoke, the prologue. And he said, no, don't do that. It doesn't belong there. I'll write you something. And that's when he wrote those brilliant, he wrote that brilliant epilogue where Nathan Gunn, like is this sort of doctor and um, Keith Fares in, in, um, in Saratoga. And then he already had that beautiful poem, Him, that was in his new and collected that won the Pulitzer. And I was on jury duty one day. And Frank calls me in ju jury duty and says, Him is the epilogue. And um so it was a real collaboration. Like he wrote for me. I'm really proud of that. And I couldn't believe that I got him to do that. So that's the story of Ellen Weston. It was a really big deal. Like when we were rehearsing it, it was hard for Jennifer Zetlin playing that role. That's why we had a woman conductor, um, the Lady, uh, Nari, Lydia Yankovskaya and Emma Griffin directing. We had to, there was a lot of handholding because the content was really difficult. And I feel like what we came up with, Fred, I'm just going to say it was uncommonly beautiful and original. I was really proud of that piece. I was really proud of it. Yep. That's, I, I was, and I'm glad you saw it. And it looked, I remember I passed you to go take a curtain call and you just touched me lightly. And it was so, I will always remember it because it was so gentle and loving at the same time. 
Well, but, you know, I'm not bragging about the piece, but I no, did. I know what you're that saying. That. I know what you're saying. This stuff is hard mm. to do to, even if you create something beautiful on the page, it's not necessarily easy to bring it to life on a stage. You're letting that poem come through you every yeah. day of your life for months. You're living with that text. It's like living for five years with the Joad family. I called Kevin from a hotel room one day and said, I need to, I, I'm so ready to let go of the Joads. I'm going to kill myself. It's a big thing letting those stories come to you. I know that. Um, you mentioned something about 45 minutes ago that I grabbed that I, I've been saving. Um, we're talking about rock and roll, actually. And I have friends, dear friends, who love rock and roll a lot more than opera and classical. And I like it very much. It's not my main turf, but I do like it. Mm -hmm. I go to rock concerts. I try to. Uh, the only reason I don't go to more is because they're so loud and I need to protect my hearing. Yes, me too. So I go to one a year usually. And I have right. I, I have one coming up in March. I've never seen Elton John perform and I have tickets. Oh, he's fine. But, um, but there's one group that I absolutely, too, really, the Who, but the other one is the Rolling Stones that I absolutely adore and have seen them on every one of their tours since the beginning. And Keith Richards said of Mick Jagger that he's a cross between James Brown and Maria Callas. And oh that's God. kind of perfect, actually. Yes, yes. It really and is. I think that the Stones are undervalued. For example, I love The Who. They've gotten Kennedy Center honors, bands like The Eagles and other bands that I wouldn't necessarily run to give a Kennedy Center honor to have gotten it. Um, Bruce Springsteen absolutely deserved it. But the Stones, no. And they're like and the Beatles. It's like how rare they haven't got one. Yeah. <laughs> I think. Yeah. I mean, the <laughs> thing is, the Beatles wrote beautiful tunes, but they were together for a decade. And then they did things on their own. The Rolling Stones have a history and have a level of musicianship and yes members of the band have died and and there have been issues but the performance aspect of Mick Jagger well let me frame it another way you were saying before that you know you've worked with many great people and singers and you've met a lot of great people so have I and because I'm an egalitarian I treat everyone the same and I just believe we're all profoundly equal and that's why i treat everyone i have to say though that when i met mick jagger i was speechless i he was at the met attending tosca and he was referred to me as i was the manager and he came and asked a question i could not get the words out and i think that there is something about him roger daltrey of the who in a different way but especially mick jagger that is really opera personified and I think that grand opera, <laughs> grand opera. And it's something that he channels into his performances consciously or not. I don't know that I can't think of any other rock singer or pop singer. You would have met Barbara Cook, who had the vocal capacity to do opera she wanted to. But there's just something about whatever opera is that Mick Jagger contains. And that's why Keith Richard was so perceptive in saying he's a mix of James Brown and Maria Collis. You named the Stones, tell me why. Because I was, I was a little boy and I was very drawn to their songwriting. You know what I mean? Like, I thought those songs were fabulous. Um, and what is, like, Ruby Tuesday. You know what I mean? Some of, the, even just some of their, my sweet lady Jane, you know, mm -hmm. those songs that were beautiful, you know, the, and they were great songwriters. Um, I was just, that's what I mean about not, that I didn't delineate. I mean, uh, my sister Susan wrote a, my, okay, when the Rolling Stones were on tour, the tour that ended up at Altamont, my brother-in-law, Michael Lydon, was the journalist for Newsweek touring with them. And my mm -hmm. sister Susan was sitting behind the guy who was brutally murdered at mm -hmm. Altamont and she was tripping on LSD and she became completely unhinged. The Rolling Stones were in my life because my sister and brother-in-law were touring with them. 
So they had a lot of resonance for me. But yeah, I, that, I thought they were great. I thought they were great songwriters. And that's how I felt. I felt The Doors, great songwriters. I felt Neil yes, Young. Yes, and, and uh, Jim Morrison had a certain, I would call him more like a leader singer than an opera singer. And but of all thing. of them, like those songs, of, she lives on Love Street, lingers long on Love Street. Those songs were great. Yeah. I mean, Neil Young, The Needle and the Damage Done, there's not a better song about addiction. There just isn't. Um, Joni Mitchell is to me as important as like Haydn or Mozart. Like j- just Joni Mitchell, the beauty of her songs was unparalleled. Just I worshipped her. Um, Judy Collins, who became a friend of mine. But, you know, her some of the songs she wrote, I just I just thought to write a great song is to write a great song, you know, um, and I loved weird songwriters like Joan Baez had a sister named Mimi Farina, and I loved Mimi Farina's song Charlotte. I was obsessed yeah. with that song, <laughs> right? And Richard Farina. How about Phil Oaks? Phil Oaks, you magnificent songwriter. Yeah. yeah. Do you do you know? Do you know that there's a um there's a book about my family, Fred? Do you know about that? Nope. It was it. It's a book called Home Fires. It was written by a guy named Donald Katz, and it came out in like 1992 and was very celebrated. Like we were on Good Morning America and Charlie Rose. We were like the Loud family for a while. <laughs> but I think you'd really like it because you're the same age as me, and it's literally about our generation. It's a book about. It's uh, It is a social history of post-war America as seen through my family. But then this guy, Don Katz, went on, he went on to start um, Audible.com after he wrote Home Fires. So wow. now he's very successful. But uh, all those guys are in the book. Phil Oaks, Peter, Paul and Mary, you know, uh, Pete Seeger. But all those guys, there was a band I loved called Earth Opera. Like I was really into a lot of weird stuff. I just, but I was... I was I was an archivist without knowing it. Like I I couldn't see a Bergman movie. I had to see them all. I couldn't. I had to know what every completist. record. Yeah, I was a completist. I really was. Yes, I'm glad it didn't end up being like objects because it was more about. I had to know everything Britain wrote down to the cello suites. Do you know what I mean? I had to know everything Tippett wrote, everything Hans Werner Hansen wrote. Every, I needed, to, yes, I was a completist. All of Berg. Oh my God, I loved Der Vine. I used to sit in the library listening to Jesse Norman's recording of Der Vine, like over and over again, like a crazy person. But yeah, I was a completist. You know, that's the thing I try to teach most to my students is, it's so sad. A lot of these kids grew up on Google and they think that's research. And I don't, we had to go to libraries. We had to take things out. We really had to listen to stuff and read stuff. And nothing was a sound bite. I read whole books. I knew all of Pauline Kael's film criticism, John, John Simon, when he was actually smart. Um, you know, just he was at one point a, an articulate critic before he became like a bitch, you know. Um, but these people wrote beautifully about film and God, did you know Brian Kello? Yes, Brian was one of my very dearest friends. He loved you. He loved your work. But Brian was on my short list of dearest friends. And two weeks ago, I had Susan Danis, who's the head of Florida Grand Opera. And she hired Brian. And I made a point with her of taking the last 10 minutes of our conversation as a tribute to Brian. So I'll send that to you. Please because- do. I love Brian. Brian was a fantastic person. I thought of him just now because he wrote a biography of Pauline Kael. That's why I brought him up. I thought it was a superb book. Yep. Right? Yeah. I knew Brian before he became famous and the Brian who Mm. the world knew. I knew him just out of college. Oh, you knew him that long? I mean, I knew him for a long time, but not as long as you. Brian came into my office when I worked at the Met and he was just down in New York for the first time and 21 and um, his 
childhood friend, Cynthia Peterson, was my co-worker at the Met. And Cynthia and I are both very much night people and Brian was a morning person. Yes. So we used Brian on Saturdays in effect to rev us up because we had to do two shows on Saturday. We had the matinee and the evening right. and then usually uh, shipping out of a show on Saturday night and payroll and all kinds of things. Saturday was a very hard day for us as workers, as opera workers. And Brian, in effect, was our caffeine. And he would get us going in the morning, then we'd give him a ticket to the matinee, and then he'd come back and kind of rev us up for the evening, and then we'd give him a ticket to the evening show. So, um, yes, Brian Kello wrote many wonderful books, uh, biographies primarily of Ethel Merman, yeah. of Sue Mangers, Carol, yeah. the Bennett mm -hmm. sisters of Sue Mangers, who was made. Who was it? Uh, uh, yeah. He wrote, yeah. But I'm trying to see the actress. Uh, uh, the Bennett sisters, the three Bennett Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. That's it. Yeah. And he was editor in chief of Opera News and then managing editor when he didn't want the responsibility of being editor in chief. And really marvelous. And people, if you go to Fred Plotkin Opera, and then enter Brian Kello, you can find the article I wrote about him when he died of a brain tumor at the age of 59. Um, Fred, but, I'm pretty sure I read that. Yeah, it was, yeah, he was one of my very closest friends. Wow. Um, so Ricky, I wanna conclude with, I don't wanna conclude with you, but we're going to. Um, you provided for I Dodge Your Listeners and viewers and, and subscribers, a wonderful list of mostly, I think I'm looking 20th century works, uh, except for Bach, say ah, Matthew right. Passion. Um, and we've discussed Lulu. The one that I didn't know, Hugo Wieskal or Weiskal, the strong is, is a work I did not know at all. Why that one? Um, Hugo Weiskal, is a composer. I have. I don't know how I discovered him. Well, I do. Remember I told you I would go through the library and anything written in the 20th century I would take out. So one time I took out, there were two operas by him. One was called The Tenor, which was based on a play by Vatican. And one was The Stronger, based on the Strindberg play. I had never, his voice was so unique to me. He was clearly a European composer who had moved to America and had somehow absorbed this sort of Americanness into his European language. Now, in a different way, I do not like when Kurt Weill moved to America. For me, he became a less interesting composer. I like Mahagoni. I like Three Penny Afro. I'm not in love with, you know, his American musicals. I like street scene, but that stuff, but... Weisskall kept his Europeanness, his thorniness, his angularity. But for example, if you listen to just the first 10 bars of The Stronger, the orchestration feels strangely American. And I really loved his language. I also felt like he wrote beautiful, strange melodies within his thorny European language. I felt like he was an incredible composer. I really became obsessed with him. I know every note he wrote. And I even became close with his um, daughter when I was in Maine and she lives in Rockport, Maine. But um, it just, it, it, I really, his, his work, I used to make mixtapes for myself at Carnegie Mellon when I was there. And my mixtapes always had tons of Hugo Weisskull on them. And did you listen to any of it? I did. I listened. No, I listened. I did not listen to the Bear Lulu because I know it. And I did not listen to Death in Venice. But the works that I knew less or had not heard recently, I listened to. And I did indeed, as well as the Hens of Fantasia for strings. Oh my the God. whole thing, not just the fourth movement, which was gorgeous. Stunning. Yeah. Stunning. Do you Talk know the last that work? Well, huh? you know how I discovered that work. When I was a kid and at the end of the, uh, the Exorcist, the very last piece of music he plays is the, that movement that I picked from the Hensa. And I had never heard of that composer. And I was like, oh my God, what is that music? And then I went crazy. 
And then I realized, you know, that the school, that Fantasia for string was actually music for a Schlondorf movie called Young Eilif. But then I realized, oh, I have heard Hans's music because the whole score to Alain Renee's movie, Muriel, is Hansa. Yeah. And the movie, um, the, the, the Lost Honor of Katerina Bloom is Hansa. I realized all those weird, wonderful, the music to um, Swan in Love uh, is, is Hansa. So I realized a lot of that wonderful film music I had heard was him. Um, but then I discovered him and I really became obsessed with him. But I would say Hansa and, and Hugo Weisskoll, their it's their early works as their work like Hansa became much thornier and so did Weisskoll like Weisskoll an opera of his was done at City Opera called Esther that my friend Lauren Flanagan I was going to ask you about that I saw that yes yeah I did not love that and everyone thought and what made me sad is that that was the opera that everyone suddenly designated it's like this man this composer has arrived and I thought they should have praised um, six characters in search of an author and the tenor and the stronger. And, you know, he, they were miserable towards him in his life. Miserable. You should have seen the reviews that that guy got, which it happens to all of us. But, oh, my God, for him, it was crippling. And I just, you know, I like his early works and I like Hence's early works. I listened to his later symphonies and, you know, he's a great composer. I just they don't sing to me. I mean, he wrote a cantata for Edda Moser called the Cantata della Fiaba Estruma. So beautiful, you could lay down and die to this music. So when you go to films, which I now know you are very passionate about, I'm not surprised, but I've, I've confirmed it. Are there films where you hear the music more than the words? And it's, follow the story because I rare. there have been films where I come out with the music and don't remember what the movie was about. Well, you know, I uh, for one thing, I love the score to Garden of the Fancy Continues. It's such a beautiful, right? By Umberto de Sica. Right. Or, yeah. But, um, and uh, people always say, why have you never written film? And I always say, I would only have written film if I could have been a Nino Rota to a, to a, Fellini, only because Nino Rota didn't really write incidental music. His music was a character in the film. So much film music is incidental music, and that to me, notes are too hard for me to be in the background, okay? <laughs> um, but I will say, I'm very rarely impressed by film scores, but I am impressed by Johnny Greenwood. I thought his score for Power of the Dog, which I thought was a superb film, was really good. There's also um, that composer, um, Randy Newman, uh, Newman, Thomas Newman. Thomas Newman has written, like even his, his music for Six Feet Under, right? I hear some, in, some music being written now for film and television that really impresses me. And I'm glad because, I'm, uh, you know, Fred, people don't understand it, but if music is in your head all day long and all night long, you just hate a lot of music. A lot of music is stupid to me, badly written. So much opera I go to, I'm just a horrible audience member because I want to rip my hair out and I can't even mention one thing or name a name or anything because that would be horrible. But like, to me, so much bad stuff is written. But then when something's good, oh my God, I'm irrepressible. You know, so James Levine said something to me more than once. My father also said to me that's something I experienced, and I wonder if you do too. Almost all the time, James Levine said, My dad said, they had music in their head, in their ears, something was playing, and they could be in conversation with someone else, but meanwhile, something was playing. It's oh, kind of like the soundtrack is on the, 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 the record players on the CD player, the streamers on. And I am often aware that that happens with me. I try when I attend a musical performance to block out whatever it is in my ears. But one time I was not bragging. It was just a fact because I worked at the Met. I was with Levine and he was playing something 
on the piano for me from Mozart. And I said, you know, there's something very similar to that in Schubert. I don't play the piano. I played the, played the clarinet. And um, he had me sing it. I'm not a singer. And I kind of sang it. And he sat down at the piano. And then with the left hand, he played the Schubert. And the right hand, he played the Mozart. And I said, well, that's why I think that Schubert got that from Mozart. And Levine, who was genius, said, well, yes, but had he done it in this key to move his hand up a little bit, then it would have been the direct copy. But what Schubert did was interpret from the Mozart, but not copy the Mozart. And, <laughs> and then I said to him, while you were playing this for me, what did you have in your head? He said, Otello. Oh, <laughs> so. oh, I love that. Listen, <laughs> can I tell you a great, I have one image of, of him, Fred, that I... I I used to be an usher at the Met. And when? Um, when I first moved to New York. So it was like the late 70s. Okay. Because I, I, I would have been your boss as of 1981. That's Maybe why. that's why you look so familiar. No, but no, no, no. <laughs> this was earlier than that. It was, I mean, it was when, for example, at one point they were doing um, a, uh, Peleus and Melizan, and it was Jose Van Damme and... Frederica von Stata. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And that's when I first heard her. So when I ended up writing an opera for her, I really had to pinch myself. But anyway. Often in Egypt, yes. Yes, yes. So, but the thing is, um, the best thing to do when you were an usher, obviously, was pull curtain. So they asked me to pull curtain one night, and it was it was Renata Scotto doing Butterfly. And which, in my lifetime, she's the greatest butterfly I've ever seen. So I was waiting to pull the curtain and it's the final scene. And James Levine, who's not conducting that night, is standing off stage sobbing. I'm talking about snot coming out of his nose like Jane Fonda and Clue. You know what I mean? Like, it really moved me. I was yeah. like, he, he is so in this. He's so moved by this. Like, you could see how much he loved music, like why he was who he was, why he was where he was. I mean. It's so sad, this, this age of cancel culture. And, and I don't think it excuses bad behavior, but can we also remember that he was a great, great, great artist? Yeah. I have one last question. Yeah. And then we'll do this again sometime, maybe okay. in front of How a How fun lot of this has been. I don't even know what time it is. Oh my God, we have more than two hours. Yeah, it's almost the length of Electra. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's actually longer than Electra. Perfect. Um, we're, we're approaching the Fleek of der Hollander. Um, <laughs> you are prodigiously gifted, but also you have apparently a gift for time organization and use of energy and time. There's an equation of time and energy. And, you know, we are only given a certain amount of time. We're only given a certain amount of energy. You teach, you compose, you are currently have two operas in rehearsal and ready to launch and or in performance in the case of intimate apparel and previews. How and you have a relationship. How do you budget your time and how do you make all that work? First of all, I have no logical answer for that other than when I'm working, I get up early every day and I do my work. I don't have rules about I'm going to work for three hours. I'm going to move. For, I work until it's out of me. Like the muse has a limited duration and you can tell when it's done. And I try to always, there's a, a Copeland said, leave your work. Always leave your work in a place where you're excited to come back to it. Don't drain yourself on any given day. When I wrote this memoir this year, I just got up every day and I wrote. That's when, That's what I know how to do. I know how to get up and do my work. I waste tons of time. I watch pornography. I am as lazy and as stupid and as philandering and everything you could imagine as any other fallible human being. But I do get up every day and I do my work. And when I have to have something done, I do it. And I rarely miss deadlines. I don't know. I just have a, I have a pretty good work ethic, but I also have a pretty strong play and wasting time ethic too. I watch tons of dumb television. I mean, 
I, you know, if the cameras were rolling, you'd be shocked that I accomplish anything. But I do for some reason. And actually, Ricky, to close, I made a note for myself on the top of the one page I have of notes here that I barely looked at. Um, that I didn't say for some reason, because we just sort of launched into our conversation, that to me, you are the current version of America's Aaron Copeland. And I would have forgotten to say that had you not just triggered it, because that's how I see you. I don't know if that's a compliment, but that's- Oh my God, it's like the greatest thing you could ever say to me. It makes me feel warm, right? Through my whole body. Thank you, Fred. I love Aaron Copeland. I do too. Talk about him briefly before we get going. He's just, he is the heart and soul of American music. I mean, it's just like you hear one note and you know everything good about America that you are. And and that's, that's what I really mean that because we have found out in the last few years that there's not, there's a lot of not very nice things about America. But Aaron Copeland is what's nice about America. Aaron Copeland is what's great about America. And you hear it in the first three notes of every piece. And you just want to celebrate having been born here and calling yourself an American. And it's just, it's beautiful. It's energetic. It's active. It's pure art. He didn't want to ingratiate himself. He didn't, he just expressed himself. And it's so authentic. I love Aaron Copeland. Yeah. Well, you just described yourself. <laughs> oh, that is very nice, Fred. I'm sending you a check. <laughs> no check required, please. Okay. Ricky, I look forward. I do have tickets for Intimate Apparel, I believe, in March. And I Great. look forward to it. And I will have to come to Genoa to see Il Giardino. Yes. Um, you know, we're recording it, though. You'll hear it probably. Oh, good. First. Okay. okay. And I encourage people especially those who did not yet know Ricky and Gordon to explore his wonderful output, his songs, his operas, and so on. And you'll beat a real American composer. Thank you, Fred. Thank, Thank you. you, Ricky. So delightful.